Okay, I'm showing that we just uh, rolled into the 10 minutes after the hour. Next up is Kubernetes clusters on KubeVirt VMs, presented by David Vossel, Alexander Grodowski, and Chang Chang. Uh, you can take it away. Yeah, thanks. Um, so my name is David. Uh, today I'm joined with Alex and Chang, who I'll let introduce themselves uh, a little bit further in a bit. And today we're going to talk about a new KubeVirt project called the Cluster API Provider KubeVirt. Uh, this is a project that Alex and Shang's team at Apple, they donated this to the open source community. And over the past few months, we've seen, um, since it's been open sourced, uh, kind of rapid progress from multiple companies all coming together to help mature this project and contribute new functionality. Okay, so to kick things off here, I'm going to talk a bit about how uh, we can use this cluster API provider, Kubevert, to run Kubernetes clusters hosted in Kubevert virtual machines. Then I'll hand it over to Alex and Cheng, who are going to talk about their use case for the project and what inspired them to create it to begin with. And hopefully, if we have time, uh, we'll finish with a short demonstration of how this works. Okay, so. To begin with, uh, I want to talk about what the cluster API is. And the briefest definition I could come up with is that the cluster API is a set of controllers, and APIs that allow us to manage the creation and life cycle of Kubernetes clusters in a declarative way. So the cluster API is this generic Kubernetes ecosystem project that defines a set of APIs that can be used to create clusters. Um, so this project is designed to be extendable, and that's where we get to the cluster API provider KubeVirt. Um, we're essentially just extending the cluster API project to allow hosting Kubernetes clusters inside of KubeVirt virtual machines. And I'm going to make more sense of that in a moment. I've got diagrams and everything. It, it should be pretty clear. Uh, before I get into that, I want to at least briefly touch on uh, the question of why we would want clusters managing clusters. And I can give you a lot of interesting use cases where I think this is valuable. And Alex and Shang are going to give you uh, more details on what inspired them and, and why they were interested in this to begin with. But I think there's kind of a fundamental and maybe more abstract answer to this question of why that goes back to a, a shift that I saw occur uh, in the early 2010s when infrastructure as a service was just becoming a thing. So you might remember 10 years ago, um, this analogy started popping up of pets versus cattle. It's an old analogy, it's been overdone, but uh, the analogy here is that uh, there was an old way of managing servers where you manually provisioned them, you put lots of resources, like people resources, and keeping these things alive. And that shifted to a cattle approach where provisioning servers, uh, it's automated, and the recovery of these servers, it's as simple as killing a machine, which is automatically going to bring up a new one to replace it. So essentially we made servers disposable, which is a way more efficient way to manage infrastructure at scale. But I saw something happen when we introduced Kubernetes. Uh, I think in a lot of ways, Kubernetes has become that old pet server. So we make a cluster, we spend all these resources keeping it online healthy, going through great links to perform, complex rolling updates successfully and putting all hands on deck when the cluster goes down. And I don't like that at all. Uh, what I want is clusters to become cattle to the point where if a cluster becomes non-functional, uh, we just shoot it and bring up a new one automatically. Uh, so the cluster API, it's, it's aiming to provide us the tools to do just that. So let's take a look at how the cluster API works. Uh, if you want to make a cluster, you start with a set of manifests, and these manifests define the cluster. So you post these manifests to a management cluster, uh, which have the cluster API controllers running, and the cluster API controllers manage provisioning your new cluster on infrastructure somewhere. So you can see in this diagram um, that the cluster API is capable of launching new clusters across various infrastructure providers or hyperscalers. And here I'm just showing a couple of examples where we have uh, clusters across AWS, and GCP. So with the introduction of the cluster API provider Qvert, uh, Qvert is just another one of these providers, We're just treating Qvert as if it's a hyperscaler, similar to AWS, GCP, or Azure. Um, however, that said, uh, 
Ubert's also a little bit unique as well because unlike AWS and GCP and Azure, Qvert runs on Kubernetes. So that kind of unlocks some new potential for us. For example, we can run clusters within clusters. So that management cluster that's actually hosting the uh, cluster API controllers, it can also host the workload controllers themselves in Qvert virtual machines. But it doesn't even have to look like that. It could uh, be other configurations as well. Uh, we could have a cluster API, a set of cluster API controllers on one management cluster, spin up new clusters within an external cluster. So we've got this ability to create clusters of clusters and like all sorts of configurations. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm hoping that those diagrams kind of gave you a visual for how cluster API works from a, from a high level. Uh, I want to make this a little bit more tangible now by looking into those cluster manifests themselves in a little bit more detail and hopefully demystifying what's going on in there. So here's some YAML. Don't let your eyes glaze over. Don't even try to interpret this. It's just a visual. Um, just listen. So there's two top level objects in this cluster manifest. And the first one is called the cluster. And here we're defining the control plane for this new workload cluster. So that includes the infrastructure hosting the control plane. In this uh, case, we're using Uvert. And the control plane provider itself, which in this case is Cube ADM. So we have Cube ADM um, controller uh, that, that's forming this control plane for us. That's the cluster object. The second object is the machine deployment. And this object defines the worker nodes for that cluster, and that includes the uh, provider hosting the worker nodes, in our case, Qvert, and the bootstrap provider that joins these worker nodes to the cluster, which in this case is Cube ADM again. Okay, so hopefully you all are still with me. The cluster object defines the control plane, and the machine deployment defines the worker nodes and how those worker nodes join that control plane. I'm going to go through a simplified progression here to show you how these two top level objects uh, progress to the point of launching those Qvert virtual machines and hosting a cluster in those virtual machines. So starting with that cluster object, within that object, we define that the cluster is going to be hosted on a Qvert provider as the infrastructure. And here we reference a new object called the Kubevert cluster. That Kubevert cluster object is going to be uh, creating the load balancer for this new cluster's API server. So this Kubevert provider is defining how clients, like if you're using kubectl, how these clients are going to access the new workload cluster's API server. That top level cluster objects also defining the control plane provider, which in our case is kubeadm. And the kubeadm control plane is configured to launch the control plane nodes as kubevert virtual machines. So in our example here, um, we're having three replicas host our control plane. So uh, the kubeadm controller knows we want three replicas. The kubeadm uh, controller uh, then defines cloud init configs for each one of these Qvert machines. And, and those configs, this is kind of where the magic occurs with a lot of this. It might be filling the gap for you. These cloud init configs are what um, kubeadm is telling these virtual machines to execute on startup in order to create this cluster. So it's like a bash script that's actually being executed telling um, these virtual machines how to form and create a control plane. So lastly, uh, we get the Qvert um, VMs themselves uh, launched up. They get assigned uh, their unique uh, cloud init bootstrap secrets, which execute a startup. And at this point, we have a control plane. So if you, if you lost track of all of that, I know there's a lot going on here. The end result here is um, the cluster object results in the creation of a load balancer for the API server traffic and the creation of the control plane nodes to actually host the control planes. We'll talk about the API server and Kubernetes scheduler and all that good stuff. So at this point, 
we have a functioning control plane for a new cluster, but we have no worker nodes. So we could use kubectl uh, to see what's going on in there, but we would be able to schedule any new pods or anything like that. So let's add uh, some worker nodes using a machine deployment. And the machine deployment references a bootstrap provider, which in this case describes how the nodes join the cluster, which we're using kubeadm again. Uh, <clears throat> We describe the infrastructure these worker nodes should be hosted on. Again, kubevert. Uh, in this case, we're going to use three replicas. So we get three unique kubevert machines as our worker nodes. The bootstrap provider is the one that's involved with uh, generating these unique cloud init secrets, which again is just a bash script. These virtual machines execute on startup, tells them how to join the cluster, in this case, how to actually join the control plane that's already been created. Lastly, the kubevert virtual machines spawn. They're going to be assigned those cloud init secrets. And when they um, boot up, they're going to join the cluster. So the end result here is we have a new cluster with a control plane hosted across three virtual machines and three worker nodes also hosted as kubevert virtual machines. All right, that's my brief intro to the cluster API and how the cluster API provider Qvert works. Uh, hopefully that gives you some context into how this works from a high level. I, I know there's a lot of complexity here. It's a really complex project, if I'm being honest. So I tried to simplify it as much as I can, but it's really difficult. Um, but maybe this gives you, you some ideas of um, the new possibilities this kind of technology unlocks as well. Uh, so when it comes down to it, the goal, at least for me, is I want clusters to be cattle. And uh, I think that the cluster API provider, um, and especially the cluster API provider, Kubert, is, is adding another tool into our toolbox to allow for this. OK, so I want to hand it over to Alice and Shang now so they can share more about their use case and what inspired them to create this project. So I will be doing the slides for you all. Uh, just tell me when you want me to change the slide. Okay, yeah. Thanks, David. Uh, thanks, David, for the walkthrough of the cluster API provider Qvert. Uh, can we click the next slide? So next, Alex can going to share our journey. Oh, by the way, my name is Chung, and uh, I'm colleagues with Alex, and uh, we work for Apple for the infrastructure team. Uh, so next, my colleagues uh, Alex and I are going to share our journey on how we. Uh, how this project was inspired and uh, made to today's shape. And I'll start with sharing some background and the use case first. Uh, so back to 2020, when I first joined Apple, I noticed a couple of our colleagues were looking for tools to help them to for the purpose of uh, uh, development and integration testing. Uh, by that time, Kubernetes was already well uh, well adapted within Apple, and uh, different development teams uh, are building their own controllers uh, and the CRDs to fulfill their business needs. Uh, they need isolated Kubernetes clusters to test their application with different combination of conf uh, configurations. And uh, the clusters also have to be dedicated to the team so that they can do uh, this uh, destructive experiment without affecting other tenants. Uh, the effort to gain the cluster should also be minimal, which means uh, ideally it should only take a, a, a simple command uh, and uh, a couple of minutes waiting to get the cluster available for testing and the tear down afterwards to release infrastructure resources. Uh, can we click the next slide? Uh, yeah, so by that time, we did run a couple of uh, large scale uh, bare metal Kubernetes clusters hosting heterogeneous workloads for Apple internal use, case, uh, for, for Apple internal use. Uh, and a VM workload is one of the most popular uh, workload types, which is well uh, adapted by different business units. Uh, it would be very natural for us to make use of uh, Kubernetes VMs to build another layer of Kubernetes clusters and offer cluster as a service to our development teams. Uh, can you click next, please? Yeah, so uh, with my background, I came from a infrastructure as a service company before joining Apple uh, by seeing bare metal servers managed by Kubernetes and uh, loaded with the Kubernetes 
my first impression, uh, my background told me that uh, we were basically running a free infrastructure as a service stack. It's kind of like a free uh, VMware vSphere, vSphere, vSphere product. So uh, can you click the next slide, please? Yeah. So then the problem is translate into that uh, how to build Kubernetes clusters from VMs, uh, which is a well solved problem in the industry by that time. Uh, there are a couple of frameworks available uh, in the community, uh, such as uh, Ansible, uh, Bosch, and uh, Cluster API, and uh, uh, and others. Uh, so among all of them, Cluster API is most uh, promising and attractive framework to employ for our project. Um, um, can you click next slide? Yes, please. So Cluster API is a Kubernetes native, uh, which is used the same uh, Kubernetes programming paradigm. Uh, the declarative nature of Class API is perfect to manage the infrastructure resources. And the Class API community is very active and supportive. The API inherits all the mirrors of the Kubernetes API ma machinery and has reached to a certain mature stage. So, and most importantly, Class API have a very nice design, uh, nicely designed architecture which splits the vendor neutral orchestration workflow in the uh, CAPI, uh, port, uh, CAPI components from the vendor specific logic into providers. And it is very extensible. Uh, the class API is adopted by multiple cloud vendors such as AWS, Google Cloud, vSphere, and, so, and more. Um, so next, my colleague, uh, my colleague Alex is going to share the detailed timeline on how we bring this uh, CAPK, uh, which is a short name for the Class API provider keyword, from an team initiative to a collaborate open source project for nowadays. Uh, so it's your turn, Alex. Thanks, Cheng. Uh, can we turn over the slide, please? Thank you. Uh, so let's rewind back to summer of 2020. Back then, internally at Apple, we had a rising need for ephemeral Kubernetes clusters with requirements that Chang already talked about. At the same time, we already utilized Kubert to run VM workloads on our Kubernetes clusters internally. So Chang had this idea of using Kubert to bootstrap Kubernetes clusters on demand. In fall of 2020, we made a proposal internally and started working on a project. Initially, it was just a couple of engineers researching various solutions already available in the industry. And by around spring of 2021, we API for the reasons that Chang talked about just a few minutes ago. So we started an active engagement with the cluster lifecycle community on this. There were a number of providers from various vendors available already and under active development, which was a great guidance for us. And there was a version of Kubert provider already open sourced by OpenShift at the time. However, that Kubert provider was based on an older implementation of Cluster API, and it was uh, not under Kubernetes 6 namespace along with other Cluster API providers. So a few months later, um, around summer of 2021, we already had built an internal proof of concept with some initial implementation based on the current version of Cluster API. So we brought it up to the community in one of the cluster lifecycle weekly meetings, and it was very well received. I should say that generally it's not a very straightforward process to open source a project, either from internal standpoint or from community standpoint. There are a lot of legal matters to overcome internally. And from community standpoint, there needs to be sufficient support from several different companies and confidence that this project will be maintained and developed in the long term. So while we sanitized our code base and went through internal reviews at Apple, at the same time, at the same time uh, we looked for support and engagement from other companies. And we found great excitement and support from Red Hat and Microsoft and others. I should say that support from the community was absolutely amazing. 
very welcoming. It was the utmost pleasure to work with the Siegelids. So we just had to do our part to leave the code. And by early fall of 2021, uh, we had an upstream repository created and lifted the initial implementation to upstream. Since then, we had terrific experience collaborating with folks at Red Hat, Microsoft, and other companies. You can check out, you can check out our repository where issues get created and PRs get submitted nearly every day. We have our weekly office hours meetings where we are discussing any issues or questions anyone might have. And uh, it's a very productive collaboration. And uh, we are in the process of opening up keyboard provider from a specific use case we have at Apple to the general purpose provider for cluster API. So please join us, uh, we'll, we'll be happy to work together. And now um, back to David for the demo. Yeah, and, and thank you all for contributing this project. Um, it, it really has been successful so far. Um, it's been great working with you all. Um, I have a demo. Let me see how much time I have left. Do I have 10 minutes left, it looks like? Yes. OK. All right, so I'll try to get through this. Um, this demo. Um, <clears throat> I'm starting with a setup that already has controllers installed for Cluster API. Um, so the Cube ADM Bootstrapper, Cluster API related controllers, and Kubevert itself, it, they're already installed, and I'm not going to go into those steps. Uh, what I'm going to do is launch, um, cluster, launch a cluster on Kubevert virtual machines within a management cluster itself. So we'll start with the clean management cluster, like the one in this diagram. I'll po uh, post a cluster manifest here. And then we'll observe a new workload cluster get created within our management cluster on Qvert virtual machines. And uh, before I go to a terminal real quick, I, I wanted to point out uh, I'm using um, a new client tool here called Cluster CTL in this demo. And this tool, uh, it can help with a lot of things in the Cluster API ecosystem um, from installing uh, the Cluster API controllers to creating new workload controllers and even getting access to those workload controllers and more. And there's a link uh, with more info about this tool that I just wanted to introduce it so you wouldn't see it and wonder what's that. That's new. Um, okay, so let's take a look at my demo. Uh, I've recorded it so we don't have to sit here and wait for things to provision. And let's see if I can get it to actually play. Come on, do it. All right, so the first thing I'm doing here is I'm going to list the pods in my management cluster, and I'm just showing you that the uh, cluster API controllers exist. Uh, in this case, we have a bootstrap controller with kubeADM, a kubeADM control plane controller, and um, the CAPI and CAPK controllers. So that's the, the standard Kubernetes um, cluster API controllers and cluster API provider kubevert controllers. Qvert itself also already exists here. So I'm going to export a couple of uh, environment variables here. And the first one is a template. And this template is um, it's the cluster manifest with variables in it. So I'm using, I'm not constructing this cluster manifest myself. I'm using one that's in our upstream um, cluster API provider Qvert repo. There's a template there. I'm defining that is the template I want to use. And I'm just going to inject some variables in there so I don't have to construct this really complex um, interrelation reference crazy manifest. Um, so I think most people probably do that as well. They don't probably construct these themselves. They take something that already works and then kind of manipulate it for themselves. Uh, so that's what I'm doing here. I am going to export a few other environment variables, just telling. Uh, where my virtual machine image is being pulled from. I'm getting it from a Quay repo um, and a few other uh, things associated with that template here. Um, and here, I'm generating the cluster manifest using cluster CTL. So cluster CTL has the ability to take a cluster manifest template, and then you assign a few variables here. I'm telling it that I want uh, Kubernetes version 
about 21, um, telling it that I want one control plane node, one uh, worker node, and uh, the namespace, and things like that. I'm telling it what template to use to inject all this stuff into. And the result is that uh, it spits out a manifest with all these variables put in it, and I pipe that into a cluster manifests.yaml file. Uh, all I have to do at this point is just post that manifest to the cluster and everything starts putting, uh, getting put in motion. So I'm declaring what I want here. Uh, I can take a look at my cluster objects and here I'm looking at the cluster object before everything's provisioned. So we see that the control plane hasn't come up yet. We can see the conditions say that uh, we're waiting on a few things to occur before the cluster is actually ready for us. Uh, in this example, I wait like 10 minutes, maybe less, I can't remember. And I execute the exact same thing again. And we can see the control plan's online and we are good to go. So let's take a look at uh, this cluster in a little bit more detail. We can see uh, the machine deployment. I only asked for one replica. So we've got one replica with our work, um, worker nodes online. And we can see the QVert virtual machines hosting this cluster. I asked for only one uh, node for the control plane and one for the worker. Uh, so we can see those two virtual machines running here. And I can gain access to this cluster now. And let's poke around in it. Uh, cluster CTL has the ability to um, get the cube config for this new cluster. It's just a convenience wrapper uh, around exporting that cube config. So I'm exporting a cube config for my uh, newly created workload cluster. And I'm going to set that as an environment variable. Um, let's start playing again. There we go. Setting it as an environment variable, I'm going to use my standard kubectl um, tooling. And now I'm actually inside that cluster, that new cluster that I create. So you can see the API servers in there. Uh, we have um, scheduler, uh, we have all the um, standard Kubernetes um, controllers, like deployment controllers and all that good stuff. Everything's working. Uh, at this point, I could launch new um, workloads, like new pods, and do whatever I wanted within this cluster. So lastly, I'll show you how to deprovision it. It's pretty complicated. No, it's not. Um, all you do is just delete the cluster object and everything goes away. So uh, that's it. Um, I showed how to create a cluster. We gained access to that new workload cluster, and then deprovisioning it is just as simple as deleting that top-level uh, cluster object. Everything disappears underneath it. Um, that's about it for our presentation. Uh, I don't know if we have any questions. Uh, I know we covered a lot. I want to thank Alex and Cheng for uh, joining me here. And uh, we'll hand it back to the moderator. Okay, right. I, I haven't seen any questions in the chat, but if anybody would like to um, speak up in the chat and we can put your mic on. Oh, Alexander, asking if we can run QVert virtual machine inside the tenant cluster. So virtual machines inside of virtual machines, inside of virtual machines. <laughs> um, yeah, you could. <laughs> uh, that would be uh, like double nesting perhaps, or, or single nesting depending on your setup. Uh, I've also been thinking about the possibility of using the management cluster to start virtual machines in the tenant cluster. So keep it flat, um, only have one layer for your virtual machines and using the kind of under layer to launch virtual machines into the tenant cluster. We haven't even talked about that uh, in the community meetings or anything like that. It's just kind of an idea that's in the back of my head right now, but yeah. Any other questions? Is I was there curious, any... actually. Oh, uh, sorry. Go ahead and answer that one. Is there any tutorial or instruction that developers can start with? Not really. We're very early in this, uh, and our quick start. I don't think it does. It exist yet? Do you do you all know? Um, no, I, I don't think it does. It's on the way. I think we need yeah. to. Solve a couple issues. But I think like your, it. I think your demo is actually like a is a good example for the quick uh, quick quick start. 
Yeah, fortunately, that might be the best thing. Uh, yeah. We are working towards a few things here. We we need to create a set of um, virtual machine images that the, um, that the community supports, so you all can use those to launch your clusters. We don't have those yet; they're on their way. And uh, once we get that, I think we have a good shot at creating a quick start that actually just functions for everyone. But it's tough. We're getting there. Uh, okay, there's a question. I, I thought I saw a link to your recorded demo video. Yes, I can, um, I can just link it here. I don't know when this link expires, unfortunately. Uh, but you can take a look at it there. Wow, there's a lot coming in here now. Uh, I think uh, for Alex, Alex, uh, Questions. I think I discussed this uh, within um, within the Kubert. Uh, um, I mean, it's kind of like a chicken egg problems. Like uh, currently, the the community use a cluster up to set up the clusters. Uh, however, we if we use the cluster API to set up the clusters, it's kind of like a chicken eggs. Like uh, we we actually want to have use uh, some different mechanism to set up the. It, it, it tests by it and then test the cube word. Uh, otherwise, if you use a class API and if there's like a bug in the cube word, we cannot, I mean, our test bed is failing. So we cannot test the test the cube word anymore, right? So that's why like, it's a chicken egg problem. Like. And, and for the record, the, the question on that was, could we potentially replace cube word CI with this work? Yeah. Yeah, you, you have to have that first cluster. That's the that's the hard part. I want clusters as cattle, but somebody has got to do the hard work of maintaining that that first layer. Uh, it's tough. Yep, inception cluster, heapception. That's what we have going on here. Anything we also else? Have a question yeah. about uh, how how is the networking configured uh, from Miguel? Uh, is there a default cluster CNI? Is Multis an opt-in feature? Yes, we've already experimented with several CNI implementations and we have proof of concept based on Flannel and Calico and Cilium. So any of these should work with very minor changes, updates, uh, pretty much out of the box. So yeah, once the cluster is up and running, CNI is a little bit out of purview of uh, cluster lifecycle. It's more of a add-on that you add on top of a running cluster. But yeah, um, most of the common implementations should work. So try it out. Anything else? Chandler, you, you were going to say something earlier, and maybe oh. you already finished. But... Uh, yeah, I was going to ask if this had anything to do with the SIG multi-cluster work. Because uh, I know we uh, looked at that before, and it had very similar concepts, but I'm not sure if this is parallel to that or involving it. I'm not sure. I'm not sure the scope of the SIG multi-cluster um, group. Yeah, like uh, uh, we we haven't considered that in uh, into the scope, but uh, like maybe later. We can do the federations, and we can do the federations uh, for the tenant cluster, which is deployed on different uh, infrastructure provider uh, infrastructure clusters. Uh, that's one option to go. 